We're called to worship by the psalmist in the words of Psalm 29, when he reminds us of the majesty and the power of our God. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders, the Lord over mighty waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. The voice of the Lord flashes forth flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. May the Lord give strength to his people. May the Lord bless his people with peace. Let us now praise and worship our God as we sing together hymn number 229 from all that dwell below the sky. We say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and God's truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, our God, who is faithful and just, will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us come now confessing our sins with humility and in faith before God and one another. Let us pray in unison. Merciful God, in baptism, you promise forgiveness and new life, making us part of the body of Christ. We confess that all too often we remain preoccupied with ourselves, separated from sisters and brothers in Christ. All too often we cling to destructive habits, hold grudges, and show reluctance to welcome one another. All too often we allow the past to hold us hostage. In your loving kindness, have mercy on us and free us from sin. As we begin a new year, remind us of the promises you make in baptism so that we may rise to new life and live together in grace. For we pray in Jesus Christ's name, amen. Let us now in silence confess our personal sins to God. Amen. Dear friends, hear the good news of the gospel as it's delivered to us in the scriptures. 
The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and plenteous in mercy. He has not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. As the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward those that fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. In Jesus Christ, by his life, death, and resurrection, our sins are forgiven. Amen. You may be seated. We want to take this opportunity again to extend to everyone in this sanctuary today uh, a warm welcome to this worship service at First Presbyterian Church. We are glad that all of you are here and we invite all of our members as well as our visitors to participate in what we call our ritual of friendship. That means to take the pad that is nearest the end of the pew toward the center aisle, uh, to fill in your name, your address, your telephone number, and the other pieces of information that we request of you there. Leave it open and pass it on to the person beside you all the way down the end of the pew, and then leaving the pad open, pass it back to its original location so that you might become familiar with those with whom you worship today. We also encourage you before you leave church this morning to speak to those around you, especially those in front of you and back of you whose name you may not know, but uh, extend your hand and greet everyone in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. To our visitors, we want you to know that you're always welcome in this church. All of our activities of education, of, of uh, work and worship and mission are open to you, and we're glad to have you participate with us. We want you to know that uh, we welcome you at any time. And if you do not have a church home in Raleigh or in Wake County, uh, we invite you to consider becoming a member of this congregation. We receive new members by profession of faith in Jesus Christ, by transfer of a church certificate from another congregation, by reaffirmation of faith if you've sort of been out of the church and out of touch with the church for a while, or we also receive affiliate members, persons who plan to be in the community for a short time as students or business people and still want a church home in this area but still want also to retain that connection with your home church from whence you come. After the service <clears throat> today, uh, there will be a time of fellowship and coffee in the Balkum Parlor, which is to the rear of the sanctuary, to the right, across the hall. And the elders, the, the pastors, uh, some of the members as well as visitors will be there for this time of fellowship. We invite everyone to join us. And if you are, as a visitor, perhaps considering very seriously church membership, there is a, an elder in the session room, the door to the far right here in the front of the sanctuary, who would be glad to talk with you and answer any questions you might have and uh, pave the way for your becoming a, a commuting member of this congregation. And also each Sunday during the church school hour, we have an information orientation session in the Balkan Parlor. Uh, it's a rotation kind of thing from Sunday to Sunday and we invite you to get on board at any time and learn more in depth about this congregation and what it means to be a Presbyterian type Christian. Again, welcome to everyone. We pray God's blessing upon all of us as we worship together today. This morning as the session met, it was our privilege to receive into the life and fellowship of First Presbyterian Church of Rochelle, Catherine DePole, and I'll ask for her to come forward with the elder sponsor, Wilson Board, Board Wilson. 
Uh, accompanying uh, Rochelle is uh, David Fox. Rochelle is a student at the <laughs> University of North Carolina. She's on a swimming scholarship, and uh, she and David met when David was in training for the Olympics in Colorado. She was there in training as well. Uh, they are to be married uh, in May. Rochelle has gone through the orientation information classes, which Jim just mentioned, and she's here to make a profession of faith and to receive baptism. So we welcome her as we gather this morning in worship. For shall hear the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always to the close of the age. For shall know that the promises of God are for you by baptism. God puts his sign on you to show that you belong to him and gives you Holy Spirit as a guarantee that sharing Christ's reconciling work, you will also share in his victory, that dying with Christ to sin, you will be raised with him to newness of life. Rochelle, in presenting yourself for baptism, you announced your faith in Jesus Christ and showed that you want to study him, know him, love him, and serve him as his chosen disciple. We ask you now to Show that purpose by answering the following questions. Who is your Lord and Savior? Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. Do you trust in Him? Mm -hmm. Do you intend to be His disciple, to obey His word, and to show His love? Mm -hmm. And will you be a faithful member of this congregation, giving of yourself in every way? And will you seek the fellowship of the church wherever you may be? Our Lord Jesus Christ ordered us to teach those who are baptized. You, the people of the church, promised to tell this new disciple, Rochelle Catherine DePaul, the good news of the gospel, to help her know all that Christ commands, and by your fellowship to strengthen her family ties with the household of God. The congregation will respond, we do. We do. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for your faithfulness promised in this sacrament and for the hope we have in your Son, Jesus. As we baptize with water, baptize us with Holy Spirit, so that what we say may be your word and what we do may be your work. By your power, may we be made one with Christ our Lord in common faith and purpose as we are recreated in a new image. O God, who called us from death to life, we give ourselves to you and with the church through all ages. We thank you for your saving love in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Michelle Catherine DePaul, child of the covenant, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And may the blessings of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, rest and abide with you, both now and forevermore. Amen. Rochelle has been received into the Universal Church by her baptism this Sunday. The Church is universal. It is Catholic. It includes all those who have been baptized and who claim Jesus Christ around this world, those in the visible Church and the Church triumphant. And because we have witnessed her baptism, we become part of her extended family. That she, as she knows of Christ, may know of that love of God through Christ through us, by our faithfulness in worship, in study, in prayer, in our service. So we have a part to play in her continual pilgrimage as one who grows in faith in Jesus Christ. We uh, will now stand uh, and have the prayer first and then stand for our singing of the baptismal response. And at the close of the service, we would invite you to come forward to extend a warm greeting to Rochelle and introduce yourself also to David and congratulate him. And uh, Bart Wilson will introduce you to Rochelle. Let us pray. Oh God, our Father, you 
have called us together to be a servant people, and you have united us into the body of Jesus Christ. We thank you for choosing to add to our number our sister in the faith, Rochelle. Together may we live in your spirit and so love one another that we may have the mind of Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom we give honor and glory forever. Amen. Let us stand as we sing together our baptismal response printed in the worship bulletin. Congratulations and welcome again to our fellowship. At this time, I shall invite forward Mr. Lewis Lamb, who is the outgoing moderator of the Church Office and Nominating Committee, as we make special presentations to two individuals with the designation, three individuals, for the designation of Elder Emeritus. And we are pleased that they are here and representatives of their family are here as well. It is my privilege and pleasure uh, acting on behalf of the congregation to uh, honor these three gentlemen. At this time, I'd like to ask Carl Bishop, Lars Shuford, and Bill Roby to come forward, please. Let's see right here. If you could turn and face the congregation from the center position here. Okay. In 1994, the session recommended to the congregation, the congregation approved a method of honoring men and women who have had long service and distinguished service, the Presbyterian Church at large, or greater church, as well as First Presbyterian Church. Uh, this was uh, the deacon and elder emeritus program. The requirements to uh, receive the designation are that you have served at least three full terms in the office to which you are being honored. and that your service be outstanding to the Presbyterian Church and that you have achieved uh, 70 years of age. George Anderson notwithstanding, we still need to make that comment. George, if you're out there, everybody still knows. <laughs> I trust these three gentlemen don't object to that as, <laughs> as much as, much as uh, George did uh, last year when, when he received the designation. So on behalf of the congregation, the nominating committee, and the, and the, uh, the uh, uh, congregation, I'd like to honor um, Carl T. Bishop. Thank you, sir. I'll shake your hand. <laughs> Forrest H. Shuford, second. And William A. Rudd. Yeah. Let us have a prayer. Gracious God, we are thankful for the call to service and ministry, and we're thankful for the lives and the commitment of these three individuals so honored this Sunday as Elder Emeritus. We ask your continued blessing on them. May the example they set be the example that we follow, that it indeed is a high calling to serve you in the life of the church, to give of self in special ways, acknowledging that you are with us always. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. We shall join in the completion of the singing of the hymn Baptized in Water, hymn 492. We shall sing stanzas two and three. At this time, the children may be dismissed for Children's Church. Let us stand as we sing our hymn Baptized in Water, stanzas two and three.
You may be seated. I invite you to hear now our Old Testament lesson, which comes from the first book of the Bible, Genesis. We are reading chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. Hear the word of God. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void, and darkness covered the face of the deep, while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. Then God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to our God. Our New Testament lesson comes to us today from the book of the Acts of the Apostle, Apostles, chapter 19, verses 1 through 7. While Apollos was in Corinth, Paul passed through the interior regions and came to Ephesus, where he found some disciples. He said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you became believers? They replied, No, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. Then he said, Into what then were you baptized? They answered, Into John's baptism. Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in the one who was to come after him, that is, in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. Altogether, there were about twelve of them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We're thankful for the teamship we have in David Covington and Diane. David is still sick. He was sick last Sunday, got better, and then took a turn for the worse. So we need to remember David in our thoughts and prayers as well. And thankful for the contributions of Diane and the choir who continue on in their excellent fashion. Fifteen minutes I heard I had to finish this sermon so folks can get out <laughs> and get home and get prepared to watch uh, the frozen tundra from Green Bay and uh, the Panthers play the Green Bay Packers. It brings back a, a lot of memories from a long time ago. I don't envy players attempting to play in that type of weather. The coldest ever got was in a game against Wabash College in Indiana, third week of November, and my hands were so cold that they didn't thaw out for three days, and the temperature never got as cold as it is supposed to be this afternoon in Green Bay. 10 degrees, 50 degrees below zero in terms of wind chill factor. Wind chill. Well, enough of that. We trust that the Panthers do well. For our TV audience, we welcome you to worship. The topic for the sermon this Sunday is glory, creation, commission, and we read the lectionary passage for this first Sunday after Epiphany, which builds on the other passages from Acts and Genesis, and yes, our call to worship from Psalm 29. We read from the first chapter of Mark, chapter 1, verses 4 through 11, which tells of the baptism of Jesus by John. Hear now this word of God directed to us. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, the one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. 
In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the spirit, and the Greek is also the Greek word for wind, the spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven, you are my son, the beloved. With you, I am well pleased. Word of God for the people of God. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious God, may the words of my mouth and meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. It's not often that I watch television, but I do so in the evening. And I tend to like the old classic movies which appear on cable television, AMC. And I saw one this past week, The Agony and the Eskasy. Perhaps you remember it. The plot evolves around Michelangelo Bunarotti. That's his last name. Played by Carlton Heston. And Pope Julius II, played by Rex Harrison. The plot is that Pope Julius wants Michelangelo Bernati to paint the Sistine Chapel. And he doesn't want to. He claims that he's a sculptor. He's not a painter. No way. But he has no choice. He's compelled to do it because Julius is Pope. <laughs> but he's totally frustrated, in agony, doing something he does not want to do with his commission. One day, in total frustration, he decides to just leave the entire project, all the scaffolding up. And before he leaves, though, he's so frustrated and angry that he defaces the work, the frescoes, that he so arduously has worked into the plaster. And Julius II is horrified, so much so that he sends out troops to find Michelangelo and to bring him back so he can complete the commission. But Michelangelo knows how to hide. <laughs> he goes into the high mountains of, of northern Italy, and we see various scenes. He's working in, in a quarry, and then when he sees soldiers, he goes higher. One day, though, an amazing thing happens as he is attempting to remain hidden from Julius II. In the high mountains of northern Italy, he experiences a theophany, a manifestation of God's glory. In his artist's eyes, as the picture depicts it, shows it, Michelangelo sees cloud formations and the sun shining through in such a way that in his artist's minds there is the glory of God, but these figures, these clouds suddenly take shape, and there is this figure of a divine figure who is reaching down with a hand and a finger pointed down, and a figure reaching up, and in his mind it can only be a scene of creation, God reaching down to Adam, and that will be the centerpiece of the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. Beautiful, have you ever seen it? Five years ago, we were privileged to see it, and I'd like to see it now since it's been refurbished. Beautiful. He experiences the glory of God, he senses creation, and in that moment, in a sense a spiritual moment, he is willing to retake the commission he denied himself. The commission now will be a high calling done for the glory of God. Agony turns to ecstasy, but he finds out that in ecstasy there is still agony. For this will be an arduous task, a hard task, a painful task, physically and spiritually and mentally. It will take over four years to complete. He experiences glory, creation, commission in a new way. In Mark's gospel, Jesus comes to be baptized by John the Baptist in the River Jordan. And there too, Jesus will experience the glory of God, a new creation as he assumes his commission as Messiah. So let us then look at this topic, glory, commission, creation, commission. Mark in his gospel is different from the other two on this account of the baptism of Jesus from Luke and Matthew. Mark's language is lean, it's stark, it's without adjectives, it's very succinct. 
But still in this passage is revealed something of a theophany. The glory of God is revealed after Jesus is baptized by John. And the point Mark is making here is that Jesus comes to be baptized by John the Baptist in fulfillment of Hebrew scriptures in order to be commissioned as Messiah. So that's our first point. Jesus comes to be baptized by John the Baptist in fulfillment of Hebrew scriptures to receive his commission as Messiah. John has baptized for the repentance of sins, pointing to the one who is to come, and in Jesus' is coming, he is the one. John the Baptist represents Elijah, the one who was to be a forerunner for the coming of the Messiah. Jesus is not baptized for his sins. Jesus is to be baptized so that he can take upon himself the sins of others. And here in this account of a theophany, there is revealed the glory of God. God's glory is revealed. After Jesus comes out of the, of the river Jordan, he experiences this theophany, the glory of God. He experiences the power of God as revealed in creation, and he hears God speak. Mark alone is the only gospel writer where this is something Jesus alone hears. And scholars refer to Mark's gospel as the messianic secret as opposed to Luke's gospel and Matthew's gospel. The language here, though, is the language of something unique, one of a kind. The language here hawks back to the words read from Genesis 1 and from Psalm 29 about creation. The wind of God, the spirit of God, the voice of God creates ex nihilo. What is done is a new thing. The glory of God, the power of God creates ex nihilo in creation. And as Jesus is baptized, that same power creation is now apparent. The heavens are ripped. The language is the language of creation. The voice of God is heard. The power of God's spirit acts. And there will be a new creation, as unique as the first. The new creation will be for you and me to deal with our sinfulness our foibles of being a human being who have sinned. For no longer will we be kept in the clutches of sin and death. Because of the baptism of Jesus and Jesus assuming his mission as Messiah, we, by the power of God's spirit of creation, working through this Jesus, will be created anew and freed from the power of sin and death. This commission means as you and I accept it and feel it, that we will go from death to life, from defeat to victory, from despair to hope, from forgiveness, of our, from, from spite and anguishness to the forgiveness of our sins. Mark wants to communicate to us that Jesus comes in fulfillment of Scripture as the suffering servant as the one who will reign, setting up a spiritual kingdom for those who will respond to the good news of the gospel. And for Jesus, it must have been a very heady experience. There must have been this moment of ecstasy for him as he comes out and hears the words spoken by God, only directed to him in Mark's gospel. You are my beloved son, with whom I am well pleased. A moment of ecstasy. But the moment of ecstasy will turn into agony. For the mission of Jesus will take him to the cross for you and me. Mark communicates here that in the baptism of Jesus, Jesus comes in fulfillment of Scripture to assume his commission as Messiah. And the theophany experience communicates a new beginning through Jesus for you and me. In the second place, as we read this and hold it in tension with the others, the Scriptures, we glean from this passage as it is a funnel through which now the gospel of Mark will come to us. That you and I, as we accept Jesus Christ, too, have a commission through our baptism and through our profession of faith, confirmation. We have a commission. Accepting Jesus Christ, our lives are to be lived in the manner of Jesus Christ. Yes, there will be the ecstasy 
the moment of realization, either intellectually or spiritually or emotionally, that, that the, there is hope because we worship a crucified and risen Lord. We have the power of that Lord in our lives, and that can bring joy and hope. And there is a sense of efficacy, but the reality is, the reality is that as we acknowledge the presence of the risen and crucified Lord in us, the same power of creation which acts through Jesus, the reality is that day by day you and I will still have to battle the forces of selfishness and greed and whatever we call sin, fight the temptation to abandon the high calling of what it is to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, and that will indeed be agonizing. But the good news of the gospel is that in the midst of the agony there can still be eschacy because we have the benefit of the forgiveness of our sins on a daily basis, acknowledging who Jesus Christ is, as we participated in the baptism for Rochelle, we heard the words that she died to sin and was raised to life. In baptism, we remind ourselves of this every time we participate in a baptism, that there is power which can flow through you and me. The same power creation is the same power that worked through the cross and the resurrection. The same power in the midst of our human foibles for us to draw on in the midst of the realities of how we live our life for Christ as we are commissioned to do so as a disciple. Michelangelo found this out the hard way. There had been agony and then efficacy. And then he returned to fulfill this high commission, but he found out how hard it was going to be working upside down on those scaffolds for four years, long years. Physical exertion, mental exertion, spiritual exertion, and exhaustion. There was still agony in the midst of eschacy, but there was this high calling, the commission to do it for the glory of God. We are to serve in the manner of Christ in light of our commission, our baptism, and our profession of faith. It is not a calling to privilege and status. It's a calling to get ourselves immersed into the wounds, into the issues of life, to get our hands stained with life for the sake of others, to move past selfishness and greed and pride, to lose ourselves on behalf of others, for it makes a huge difference if we claim Jesus Christ in terms of what we are able to do to acknowledge the worth of every human being, no matter who he or she is of any race and nation, of any social, political, and economic condition. It makes a huge difference in the communities where we live and work. What would happen if every Christian community, whether Presbyterian or Lutheran or Baptist or Methodist, Episcopalian or Roman Catholic, Assembly of God or whatever, took seriously our commission? Life would be different and our communities would be different. It may be hard, but there would be the influence of what life could be life lived apart from the sin of selfishness and greed and vested selfish interest where self is put over above others. And someone has to be down with a heel on top of their head so that I can be number one. William Barclay tells the story of an investigative reporter by the name of Mr. Bruce Barton, who was given an assignment by his editor basically to discredit the leading evangelist of that day by the name of Billy Sunday. Uh, the editor thought that perhaps Billy Sunday was a charlatan. Billy Sunday at that time was a Presbyterian evangelist, a former baseball player. And so the reporter set out and he determined he would go to three communities. He would not go to the churches to talk with people how he went. He would, he would talk to people in the community. So he went first in one community to the merchants. What happened after we had this revival here and all these churches got this fellow to come in? Did he soak you? Did he take out of the community you know, resources you know, for himself? And the answer was startling. The merchant said that in light of the revival, which was an ecumenical revival put on by the churches of the various denominations, strange thing occurred. Individuals who had run up debts with various merchants found out that individuals suddenly appeared and their debts had been written off the books. They were so old. As a matter of conscience, these individuals wanted to set the record straight terms of what it meant to be recreated anew, to deal with a power which could give them hope and new directions past failure and past their abuse of others. The merchants found out that these folks wanted to pay up. 
set the record straight. He went in another town and talked to the president of the Chamber of Commerce. And the fellow admitted that he was a member of a church, not all that active, but he had gone to the last ecumenical revival. And he said, you know, if we were to do it again, I would be much more positive. He said, I was not very positive about this Billy Sunday. But she said, you know, if the religious community could not raise the money to bring him back, I could raise it in half a day. And the reporter said, why? He said, well, you know, we have circuses which come through here every year. And they'll leave people feeling good and good laughs. But you know, in the aftermath of this ecumenical revival about this gospel of Jesus Christ left a different moral climate. It makes a difference. If you're called upon to treat other people like you want to be treated, it makes a difference if you're freed from insecurities of selfishness and meanness. The world evolves around me to treat other people in the social arena, in the political arena, in the economic arena as you would want to be treated. It makes a difference when we are freed by the gospel the glory of God, this creation from crea uh, which created ex nihilo, which flowed through a crucified and risen Lord, which gives us life, it makes a difference when that power flows through us in terms of how we live life in relationships. It may, time, may take time for someone's conscience to catch up with them. But amazing things happen. Indeed, it took 50 years for the conscience of a group to catch up with their reality. The article was in yesterday's paper. Did you read it? Shaw University had, was commissioned by the U.S. government to rectify a mistake made some 50 years ago. 239 servicemen were honored with the Medal of Honor. But it was strange that no black Americans who served in World War II ever were honored. They got the Distinguished Medal. True, there were not as many Afro-Americans as whites. There was a small percentage in World War II. But it was even stranger that not one had ever been honored. But as a result of the U.S. government's commission to Shaw University and the findings of Shaw University, the U.S. Army has determined now that they will honor seven individuals, only one of whom is still alive. Only one of whom who is still alive. It makes a difference when somehow, somewhere, the power of God works through individuals who want to do what is right, recognizing the worth of human beings created in the image of God. And that same power can flow through you and me as we too in our baptism and our profession of faith attempt to live out our commission in the name of Jesus Christ. Every day with whomever we may meet. On this first Sunday of Epiphany which comes after Christmas, we acknowledge the amazing thing God does for us through Jesus as our Messiah. On Christmas Eve, as we gathered in this sanctuary and we lighted the Christ candle, we heard the words of John. I am the light of the world. Those who follow after me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. You see, that's what's supposed to happen through you and me because of our commission and our baptism and our profession of faith. The light of a crucified and risen Lord born at Bethlehem who died on the cross and who was raised for us, who ascended in glory, gives us the power to be lights wherever we are. Wherever we are. May what we do in the name of Christ result one day before the throne of grace in the words of scripture, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Amen. And now, having heard the word read and proclaimed, let us affirm our faith together using the words of the Apostles' Creed. All who are able are invited to stand as we say together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, 
born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. seated. Now let us unite our hearts and our minds together in prayer. Let us pray. Gracious and ever-living God, we pause and give you thanks for the many blessings that you have given to us and all whom, we, whom you have made. We have been given this beautiful creation that we often overlook. Help us to see the majesty before us and to remember to take time to notice the flowers and trees, the smells and tastes, the sights and sounds that we often take for granted. Almighty God, we are thankful for the many people you have called to lead your church throughout the ages. Today we have been reminded of the many people who have dedicated themselves to your service for many years humbly serving your church with the many gifts you have given. Eternal God, one of the gifts that you have humbled us with is the gift of prayer. You have given us the blessing of bringing our hopes and fears, our joys and concerns, and turning them over to you. God of compassion, we turn to you now with the many things that lay heavy on our hearts and the hearts of those whom we know. We remember those who suffer want and anxiety because they have no work. Guide the people of this land, help those who go without and yet long to labor and to serve you. We lift up to you those members of our family who are suffering at home and in the hospital. Be with them as they go through difficult times and work toward healing, whether it be in body, mind, or circumstance. We pray especially for those who have lost loved ones and friends and family. We pray for those who have gone before us to be with their Lord. <coughs> Help those who grieve to get through difficult times of loss. Comfort and relieve, O oh Lord, the many people we often overlook in our prayers, those who suffer in silence. We each face difficulties that we often do not voice to others. Help us to be more aware and open to friends, family, and neighbors that may be going through hard times. <clears throat> we pray especially for those who have suffered violence and abuse in their own homes for all who are in trouble, in sickness, or may be experiencing any other need, especially those known to us. Heal them, working in them by your grace, wonders beyond all they may dream or hope, through Jesus Christ, our Savior, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. 
And now let us receive God's tithes and our offerings. We pause, O oh God, to give you thanks for the many blessings we have been given. We humbly present before you these our gifts, that they may be dedicated to your service to further the work of your church. It's in your Son's name whom we pray. Amen. Let us join together in the singing of our closing hymn, God of Grace, God of Glory, number 420. and God. Our glory, our glory. 
remind you after the service, we invite you to come forward to welcome our new member. And perhaps if Dr. Bill Roby and Forrest Shufid and Carl, if you could stay right there, perhaps folks would like to congratulate you and wish you well too. Thank you. Let us have our prayer. Gracious God, in light of our own baptism and our profession of faith and our commission, may we sense every day the glory, the new creation possible because of our Savior and our commission to serve in the manner of Christ in every way, in every day, of every moment of our lives. Give us grace and strength to serve you as we go forth this day with the commission we have as those who claim you as Lord and as Savior and as Christians. And now the grace of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit rest and abide with each one of you, both now and forevermore. Amen.